really strange things happen seemingly without explanation. The use of psychic espionage by the CIA during the Cold War appears to have been a dubious program. Unbeknownst to everyone, the program had been secretly recruiting people to gather intelligence. And while at it, they accidentally uncovered an alien base hidden in Mount Hayes, Alaska, revealing that the competition between the superpowers extended beyond human warfare. Reports of seeing UFOs are common when it comes to Mount Hayes. Everything from strange lights to flying saucers and UFO sightings have all been reported by locals in this vicinity. Since the vast majority of UFO sightings supposedly vanish without a trace in the sky, the idea that the mountain conceals an alien base is not out of the question. What's the real story on the covert extraterrestrial base operated by the CIA in Alaska? Could there be a portal through which the UFOs enter within the mountain? Join us as we explore how the CIA's secret alien base in Alaska was exposed. Are we alone in the universe? For countless millennia, people all around the globe have held the belief that there must be life beyond our solar system. But recently, there's been a noticeable shift as discussions about unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial life have moved from outside the mainstream to in to the corridors of power. United States congressional hearings have focused on unidentified flying objects, now more often referred to as UAPs, and even NASA has weighed in. Consequently, why are a number of politicians and scientists starting to take this seriously now? The modern UFO craze started in the 1940s. World War II had just ended, and the Cold War was on the horizon, and new weapons were being developed by rival superpowers. In June 1947, a private pilot named Kenneth Arnold claimed that he saw strange objects flying near Mount Rainier in the U.S. state of Washington and reported it to authorities in the press. When asked by a journalist to explain their motion, he compared it to the skipping of a saucer across the water. For contemporary UFO lore, nevertheless, this was merely a prologue. In July 1947, a rancher found some odd-looking debris near Roswell, New Mexico. He took it to the sheriff, who passed it on to the nearby Roswell Army Airfield base. Those at the base initially said it was a flying disc, but the official line was then clarified and it was said that it was a weather balloon. The object was actually a high-altitude surveillance balloon to look for Soviet nuclear tests in the atmosphere, which was a secret program. But this military officer said, oh, it's a flying saucer. And of course, then it's off to the races and now you have Roswell as the ground zero for UFOs. The United States administration had some major concerns, including the possibility that American airspace was being intruded upon by an enemy nation which was fueling the public's increasing awe and terror regarding UFOs. The United States government launched a number of programs in the 1940s and 1960s to determine the potential danger of UFOs. By the end of the last project in 1969, it had accumulated over 12,000 UFO reports, the majority of which could be explained, but 701 were given the unidentified label people in the United States started to think UFOs were proof of alien life when the government started investigating them. In the 1970s, retroactive conspiracies began to circulate concerning another incident that occurred in 1947, Roswell, and the assumption that the United States government was involved in concealing supposed encounters grew. Just weeks after Kenneth Arnold's encounter on Mount Rainier, a news article came saying, a flying saucer had crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. However, no one paid much attention to it until decades later. The United States military first dismissed the object as a weather balloon, but declassifications made after more than 40 years of study revealed the balloon had been monitoring radiation from nearby nuclear test sites. Is this the reality of Roswell? Or is it just another elaborate cover-up to prevent people from thinking about something even scarier than nuclear weapons detonating near cities? Area 51, located in rural Nevada's Groom Lake, is the legendary birthplace of the conspiracy theory that the government is hiding evidence of aliens. Area 51 was constructed in the 1950s, but the CIA didn't admit its existence to the public until 2013. Until that time, 
the mysterious base's function had remained a mystery, despite the fact that State Route 375, which passes close by, has been officially nicknamed the Extraterrestrial Highway, due to the high number of reported UFO sightings in the area. Although the United States maintains other secret sites across the globe, the popular belief is that alien contact evidence can be found in Area 51. The military outpost has become a fixture in popular culture, to the point where millions of people joined up for a Facebook event to storm Area 51 in September 2019. Few people made the trip, and some of those who did were detained. The U.S. Air Force still takes security very seriously, notwithstanding the declassified materials and the widespread fictionalization of Area 51. As the U.S. government was looking into UFO sightings, some members of the public became convinced they were evidence of extraterrestrial life. A less well-known but no less fascinating conflict was raging in the murky halls of Cold War espionage as the U.S. and the USSR fought for world dominion. This conflict did not involve conventional weaponry or armies, but rather the unexplored frontiers of the human mind. A covert initiative called Project Stargate was born out of this high-stakes era of the United States government's exploration of the psychic, extrasensory, and unknown realms. During the 1970s, the United States Army launched Project Stargate, which was later taken over by the Central Intelligence Agency to investigate the possible intelligence and military uses of psychic phenomena. This mysterious program had its roots in Skinate, an earlier CIA program, which was motivated by the suspicion that the Soviet Union was heavily funding psychotronic research for warfare. This competition for psychic supremacy was a component of the Cold War strategy, in which the two superpowers were continually seeking to outdo each other. The work revolved around remote viewing, a technique whereby people, called viewers, employ mental processes to perceive faraway or unseen objects. If this capacity could be tapped, it could radically alter intelligence gathering, enabling operatives to see into enemy territory, find concealed assets, or even foretell future occurrences. Physicists Russell Targ and Harold Puthoff spearheaded the study at California's Stanford Research Institute, SRI. Among the many participants, was the future mentalist and illusionist Yuri Geller, who became famous for his spoon-bending tricks and who was first said to have shown paranormal perceptual ability when tested for remote viewing. Critics, including psychologist Ray Hyman, pointed out anomalies and accused some participants, including Geller, of being frauds. The methods and results were frequently inconsistent and untrustworthy, adding to the project's many problems, despite some initial enthusiasm. This program sought out people who claimed to have psychic talents. They were supposed to use these people to spy on Soviet installations. But they ended up discovering something even more incredible. Alien bases hidden in the Earth's isolated areas. Rosemary Smith's alleged assistance in locating a downed Soviet spy plane in Africa is one success tale. She apparently achieved a rate of accuracy higher than the typical minimum of 65% in these types of studies. By the end of that year, the research group at SRI had invited Uri Geller, a former Israeli paratrooper who had gained worldwide fame for his psychic abilities, to undergo testing at Menlo Park. While Geller was primarily known for his purported capacity to mentally bend metal cutlery, the CIA was considerably more intrigued by another of his claimed abilities, the capacity to read minds and even control them. Declassified documents reveal that CIA analysts were interested in studying Geller's mind projection abilities and how they could be utilized for national security reasons, according to Annie Jacobson's book, Phenomena, The Secret History of the U.S. Government's Investigations into Extrasensory Perception and Psychokinesis. Jacobson asserts that Geller was instrumental in initiating the United States government's investigation into extrasensory perception and psychokinesis. In fact, she states that Geller participated in a battery of secret psychokinesis experiments at a Livermore, California facility where scientists were working on advanced nuclear warheads, laser systems, 
and other new weapons technologies in the winter of 1975. Following the CIA's decision to discontinue its involvement with extrasensory perception in the late 1970s, the program was transferred to Fort Meade, Maryland, operated by the United States Army and supported financially by the Defense Intelligence Agency. For the larger part of the following 20 years, the program's funding was continuously authorized by Congress. One of the remote viewers associated with the government's top-secret program was Joseph McMonagall, an Army veteran who, according to his later interviews with the Washington Post, was involved in about 450 missions from 1978 to 1984. These missions included assisting the Army in locating Iranian hostages and leading CIA agents to the shortwave radio hidden in the pocket calculator of a suspected KGB agent apprehended in South Africa. In 1989, another viewer, Angela Della Fiora Ford, was asked to assist in the pursuit of a former customs agent who had escaped. She was able to identify the man's whereabouts as Lowell, Wyoming. Even though U.S. Customs was capturing him 100 miles west of Lovell, W.I. Despite public denials by the Pentagon that it was funding any form of psychic research, details of government experiments began to leak out in the 1980s. In 1995, the CIA issued a report from the Independent American Institutes for Research that finally admitted the long-rumored U.S. government's involvement with remote viewing for intelligence and military purposes. According to the report, Stargate was also deemed a failure because it remains unclear whether the existence of a paranormal phenomenon, remote viewing, has been demonstrated. The analysts did admit that some trials had been successful and that something beyond odd status to Cal Hiccups was happening but they still came to the conclusion that the information remote of viewing had given them was too becri and ambiguous and hadn't yielded any good intelligence. According to Jim Mars's book Psispis, SRI physicist Dr. Harold Puthoff started investigating psychic phenomena in the early 1970s. After reading a book about Russian psychic experiments, which piqued Puthoff's interest, his colleague Clive Baxter had been conducting psychic experiments, and one of his co-workers, Ingo Swan, appeared to have genuine psychic abilities. One of these skills was what Swan called remote viewing, which was visualizing objects or places at a distance. At the Stanford Research Institute, during the early stages of the remote viewing program, Ingo Swan is famous for a session when he was requested to describe the contents of a sealed envelope placed within a safe. The contents of the envelope in the safe were precisely as Swan had described them, including drawings of mountains, a horse, and a person riding the horse. The researchers were surprised to find that the actual contents matched Swan's descriptions, even though he could not physically access or see them using conventional means. It is often said that this demonstration is a compelling example of Swan's supposed abilities, but as with other cases of remote viewing, there is still some debate in scientific circles about its reproducibility and reliability under controlled conditions. The demonstration was part of the early attempts to test and explore the potential capabilities of remote viewing. The CIA secretly supported the research and designated Ingo Swan as its pioneer in remote viewing. Other psychics, like Pat Price, a former police commissioner, also became involved in the project. Based on longitude and latitude, they used the Scan 8 protocol to evaluate locations. Their drawings showed remarkably accurate details, such as a high-tech compound with a big radar dish, guardhouse, and jeeps. However, when given the coordinates of a CIA analyst's West Virginia vacation home, they depicted something completely different, a different location with important discoveries close by. Pat Price and Ingo Swan detail their experiences as remote observers of a top-secret NSA facility, Sugar Grove, using only their psychic abilities and coordinates. They successfully identified the site, which contained a massive gantry crane and steel spheres, although the relevance of these findings was not immediately apparent. The first person to be trained by SRI to use remote viewing for Project Stargate was Army Intelligence Officer Joe McMonagall. In an interview, McMonagall said, 
If someone would have told me we think you are psychic and we want you in this program, I would have told them what are out of your gourd. McMoneagle was more than a little reluctant when he was first invited to discuss the project. He says a bunch of men were brought into a room and asked about paranormal topics. McMoneagle recalls that his reaction was that he felt the army needed to be on top of paranormal research due to the possible implications. This response must have been what they were seeking, because he was soon subjected to psychic testing, which he surprisingly demonstrated a remarkable talent for. According to McMoneagle, the original Stargate group of six remote viewers ran for nearly 20 years and was tasked by nearly every known intelligence organization with retrieving data on missing fighter bombers, terrorists, enemy bases, and even a kidnapped general. Sometimes the projects brought to them were cold cases that were over a year old, but within hours their group could provide new information, which was accurate 22% of the time. In addition to the general interest in UFOs that pervaded the program, McMoneagle mentioned that he had personally remote-viewed alien bases on the moon in his autobiography, Penetration, The Question of Extraterrestrial and Human Telepathy. Swan recounts many of these experiences in his books detailing his career as a psychic spy. Most of the remote viewing of ETs and UFOs was done independently of requests by governmental agencies, says McMoneagle. However, he did recall being asked about an object he sensed while remote viewing a base in the Eastern Bloc for the Air Force. He described a saucer-shaped object at 13,000 feet, moving at 4,000 miles per hour that had made a hard 90-degree turn. He later found that at that target, the Air Force had gotten pictures of an unknown object traveling at 3,900 miles per hour at 11,000 feet that had made a hard right turn just as McMone Eagle had described. Project 8200 reached a turning point when, through a twist of fate, one of the remote viewers found himself projecting his consciousness to Alaska's Mount Hyas. This inhospitable peak, detached from any civilization, was supposedly a clandestine extraterrestrial base. As the psychic probed further, he asserted seeing structures built by aliens and advanced technology that surpassed human capabilities. This was only the beginning, though. Additional psychic investigations supposedly uncovered extraterrestrial bases in the Australian Mount Zeal, the Zimbabwean Mount Inyangani, and the Spanish Mount Perdido, all of which were described as centers of high technology and energy, perhaps functioning as monitoring stations or relay points for some unidentified extraterrestrial purpose. Two separate investigations of the veracity of SRI's work led to the 1995 shutdown of Project Stargate. One of these investigations, led by Dr. Jessica Utz of the University of California, came to the following conclusion. It is clear to this author that anomalous cognition is possible and has been demonstrated. The government's decision to end its experiment in psychic spying was based not on belief, but on generally accepted scientific criteria. However, a different study by Dr. Ray Hyman of the University of Oregon came to a different conclusion. Despite the program's shutdown that year, the government's fascination with psychic phenomena continued. In 2014, a four-year program, costing about $3.85 million, was initiated by the Office of Naval Research to investigate the use of premonition or intuition, sometimes referred to as a sixth sense, or even a spidey sense, after the web-throwing superhero, among sailors and marines. Even after the program was shut down, Dr. Edwin May, the former head of Stargate, continued to advocate for extrasensory perception as a valid tool for both military and domestic intelligence. In 2015, May told Newsweek that his most recent extrasensory perception study, funded by the nonprofit BL Foundation, is probably the best experiment in the history of the field. Belief in extrasensory perception has a long history of support among ordinary Americans, regardless of its use for espionage purposes. A 2005 Gallup poll found that 73% of Americans believed in paranormal phenomena overall with 41% of that group claiming to believe in extrasensory perception specifically. One could argue 
that the results of Project 8200 are implausible, given that the field of remote viewing is controversial and many scientists doubt its veracity. On the other hand, supporters of the claims point to the reliability of psychic reports and the specifics of the technology and locations used to back them up. Moreover, the project dates back to a time when the lines between science and pseudoscience were blurry and the Cold War's insatiable need for strategic advantages drove some of the most bizarre and intriguing scientific investigations of the period. Although Project 8200 did not offer conclusive answers, it did broaden the conversation surrounding these deep questions, including the alleged finding of extraterrestrial bases by CIA psychics, which is more than simply a Cold War anecdote. It is a story about the human need for knowledge, the curiosity about what lies beyond our present abilities, and the age-old question of whether we are truly alone in the universe. Project 8200's legacy serves as a reminder that the quest for the unknown can lead us to the most unexpected places, even within ourselves. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.